Okay, welcome everyone to episode 69 of the Less Doing Podcast. My name's Felix Bird, and here is your host, Ari Mizell. Hey, everybody. Hi, Felix. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening in. So we're, uh, we're definitely increasing the frequency of the podcast, which is awesome. So I'm, I'm going to have to get out of the habit of being like, last week we talked about this. So we're, we got two in this week, which is awesome. So thank you for that, Felix. Oh, well, of course. So uh, why, don't we start with, uh, why don't we start with the review and then we'll go to the question. All right. Um, okay. The review is from Rob Campbell. And it's a five-star review on Amazon. He's, he writes... This book takes the 80-20 the rule to the next level. We all know focusing on doing more with less sounds with less time sounds like a great concept, but implementing the concept is another issue. This book is a toolkit for people that actually want to do it. The book is small and an easy read, but I, have to f- but I find I have to reread it again and again to change old habits. Even if you don't subscribe to every less-doing tactic, Understanding how to leverage your time with technology makes this book a must-read. I can hardly wait for the sequel. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Yes, thank you, Rob. And, of course, as usual, if you hear us read your review, just get in contact with us through the website, and you will get an awesome Less Doing t-shirt, such as the one that Felix is wearing like right this. now. Yes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> like I that remember. one. Exactly. <laughs> so, yes, thank you very much, Rob. Much appreciated. Uh, and then uh, we got one question this week, so let's hear that. Yeah. Um, Sarah F. asks, uh, what CRM system do you recommend? I currently use Salesforce and I find it really tedious. I also find I like, I don't like, uh, I also feel like I don't use half the features in it. Ah, Okay. So that's a pretty common issue, I think, with Salesforce. So for, for those who don't know what a CRM is, it's a customer relationship management system. So basically, that's, you know, what most most companies, a lot of companies have some form of it, or, or a lot of freelancers do too. But it's basically how you manage the communication or the relationship with your clients, and as far as when you follow up with certain people, you know who's a hot lead, who's a cold lead, like all that kind of information. So the two top dog ones are basically Salesforce and Infusionsoft, and they're both very, uh, they're pretty expensive, and they have unbelievable features. But most people, I find, and I had this experience when I tried to use it myself. <clears throat> Most mm-hmm. people end up using literally like a tenth of the features. Oh, okay. So there's a couple of options, and this it really kind of depends how you want to attack this. So if you're if you're a larger company, I actually would recommend something. If you want to use Salesforce, that's great. But obviously, the question is here: you know, what can we use? Not like Salesforce. So first of all, uh, High Rise made by Thirty Seven Signals is actually a pretty good good system, uh, and I, I, it integrates really well with Google, with Google and some other contact sources, and uh, it works with Teams, and I, I think it's pretty straightforward, but even that to me is overly complicated, <clears throat> because at its heart, a CRM system is really about following up with people when you should be following up with people, and quite mm-hmm. honestly, that is a large part of the stress that people feel related to email is that thing about, uh, did I get back to that person? And did they get back to me? And then did I get back? You know, it just goes on and on. And that's, that's really where a lot of email stress comes from and why so many people don't delete emails and they have thousands of emails in their inbox. It's true. Yeah. So it's real. Well, right. So that's, it's really common. Mm -hmm. So there are three kind of, there are three options and I actually recommend using all of them if you want. And I use all of them. So the first one at a very, very basic level is followup.cc. And I've recommended followup.cc before many times. I personally find it to be yeah, the number great. one. Yeah, it's amazing. It's my number one productivity recommendation. However, it really can function as a CRM in a way because really it's about follow-ups, right? So you email someone and, you know, oh, let's talk next week or let's talk after this vacation or, you know, let's. it was nice meeting you, let's talk in the future, whatever. And all you're doing is BCCing a time period at followup.cc. And for those of you who have not heard me talk about followup.cc before, it's a free-to-try service, and then uh, once you use it a certain amount, it, it becomes a uh, paid-for service. But it's, it's, I think it's pretty inexpensive. And basically what you're doing is from any email service at all, which is great, because you're going to hear this, some of you, peop- some of you are going to hear this and say, oh, that's just like Boomerang. Boomerang is great, except that you have to be in Gmail. This works from your iPhone, it works from Outlook, it works from Yahoo, or wherever you are. Any email, you don't need any 
thing and you don't need a plugin you don't need anything it's just email based right which is also good if you work in a corporation or even a financial institution that uses serv- that blocks certain services that you can't use plugins yeah. or things like that yeah and i've actually i did a consultation for the the uh, what was it called? The British the consulate. consulate, right? Yeah. Exa- exactly. Yeah, the British yeah. consulate in Toronto. No, yeah, so, yeah, it was Toronto. Right, right. and, and <laughs> they had they couldn't use like anything. They couldn't use Evernote. They couldn't use Gmail. Of course, they couldn't use like anything. But they can use follow up because you're sending an email. So the way it works on a very basic level is that you send an email to someone, and then in the BCC field, you could write three days at followup.cc or Thursday 9 p.m. at followup.cc or one month at followup.cc, whatever you want. And at that time, the email will come back to you in your inbox, and it'll include a snooze functionality so that you can either deal with it right then or you could defer it to a better time. So basically, that's all I need as far as a real hard, like not hardcore, but a straightforward CRM system. If I want to follow up with somebody, it's always taken care of that way, whether it's somebody that I'd like to interview for my podcast or somebody that I have to send a bill to or just a new possible client, I'm always using followup.cc. So that's the that's a deliberate one. But then the other two recommendations that I have are super cool because they're basically completely automatic. So there's one is called Musubi and the other one is called Contactually. So oh, yeah. we're going to have these both in the sh- we're going to have all this in the show notes of course, but Contactually they, they work very similar. Basically what they can, what they'll do is they'll scan your email and they work with multiple email services. They definitely work with Gmail, but they work with some others. I, I know that there's a plug-in for Outlook for contextually and stuff. So it'll scan your email traffic. It'll see who you're talking to, who you haven't talked to in a while, who you have talked to a lot, and then whatever. It, it recognizes these patterns. And basically every day you get an email and it says, these are the five people that we think you should be contacting today. Yeah. Which is so badass. because. Yeah, it's great. And I have to say, when I see that email... It, there's usually they're usually right about three of them, three out of five, like which is amazing, you know. And one one of them it might be just somebody that I don't care about talking to anymore, or one it might just be somebody that wasn't actually a person. It might have been like a customer service email, whatever it might be. But those three emails, it's like, and it's caught friends that I haven't spoken to in a while, and it's also caught clients and you know people that I've spoken with, and it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And and what I love about it, just from a con- conceptual point of view, is that I'm always talking about the essential versus the optional, right? So you have to realize that, it's, of course, it's not going to get everyone that you're supposed to, but it's probably going to get a bigger portion than you're dealing with now. Yeah, right. So right. You, you only have that to gain. So those, those, are, those are my recommendations, basically. Uh, Sarah, I would try followup.cc and Contactually and Masubi. And you know, I know that sounds like three services you have to start up and use right now, but really Masubi and Contactually just kind of work. And then followup.cc is the one that you make a little bit more deliberate. So, great. Yeah. So there's there's uh, the the CRM system, and, and Felix, we're gonna have to work on your inbox. Yes. <laughs> so yes, I'm the ultimate culprit. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a study that I read this week, and I wanted to talk about this one first because this is relevant to our conversation in the last podcast about breakfast. You know, we talked about skipping breakfast. Yes, absolutely. So this is from the same site. This is from Subversity, and what the study had, what the study found, which I thought was really interesting, was that uh, it was basically looking at the same thing about skipping breakfast, but lean people versus overweight people. And yeah. what they found that is that the post breakfast, uh, the post breakfast skipping binge is overweight specific, meaning that people who are overweight, if you try to get them to skip breakfast. By the time that they get to eat, they're basically going to gorge themselves, whereas a lean person is going to reduce both their energy intake and their sugar intake when they skip breakfast, Okay, which is kind of amazing. So this, this makes a lot of sense in terms of like what I do as far as the intermittent fasting, and that's really what it's talking about is that if you do intermittent fasting where you're not eating breakfast or skipping breakfast and you are a lean person like, like you are as well, uh, there's actually – real benefits to it. But if you're an overweight person, it's basically going to, your body's going to be like, whoa, what's going on? Yeah, we better yeah. make up for that deficit. Whereas the lean person will huh. actually more quickly dive into their fat stores. Wow. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, and I'm, I have a little bit of a cold right now. I don't know if people can hear that. And because of that, I basically, I had breakfast this morning and I, I felt fine, but it was just, it was interesting for me because I felt hungrier much earlier than i usually am mm-hmm. so it's basically like i'm you know starting the engine earlier than normal in a way 
Yeah. So I found that to be interesting. Anyway, and also in retrospect to last week's last week's study, which probably had some flaws in it as we discussed. So this this makes a lot more sense. So basically, if you want to try intermittent fasting, you probably should get to a slightly leaner place first. Although it definitely can help someone who's losing weight to get over certain plateaus. So, okay. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, and then there was another st uh, study done as well, and then the rest of this is not study-based. But the, the other study was about teaching empathy to narcissists. And the reason that I find this relevant is I wrote a while ago about a book that I read uh, called – I'm looking for it. It's called The Wisdom of Psychopaths. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. We, we mentioned this a few episodes back. Oh, okay. Right. So, yeah, I, yeah, well, yeah. I, I, lo I obviously really like the book. And, of course yeah. – there's all these books that you know, or articles or books that you tend to read, and you start to like worry or see things about it in yourself. And so I read the book, and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm part psychopath." <laughs> um, but anyway, basically, the the main crux of the issue is about empathy, and essentially, or narcissists are it's sort of like an extreme version of selfishness, and you're not concerned with other people to the extent that you actually narcissists will not be concerned with other people's misery or demise or any of that stuff. So what they did in this study, which was weird, but what they did was they basically had the, the, the people in the, the study watch this video of a woman describing an experience of physical abuse, uh, or they listened to an audio recording of somebody describing a really hard breakup. And oh, yeah. half the group, by the way, the, they had to get, there was 200 people in this study. So I'm not exactly sure how they found 200 narcissists. <laughs> Um, and that must have been a fun group to be around. <laughs> but uh, you know, basically, half the group was told there was, there was a narcissist convention. I they, guess so. They just, they just corralled them. But why would they? Why would they gather if they were narcissists? <laughs> they wouldn't care what anybody else had to say. Uh, so they basically they told half of the group to imagine how the person feels and try to take their perspective in the audio video, imagining how they're feeling about what is happening. And then the other half was just told to pretend, pretend that they were watching the video at home. So the, the group that was told to imagine how she was feeling apparently exhibited normal levels of empathy, empathy uh, which they determined by self-reported feelings as well as raised heart rate. So there was very promising evidence, apparently, that because narcissism is a, is supposedly on the rise in the world, but that you can train empathy. But my issue with the study is that if somebody is a narcissist, then they probably want to perform well in general. It's like a natural competitive nature. This is just, this is a total guess on my part. Like if somebody's narcissistic, then they don't want to be seen as not being able to do something, right? That would mm -hmm. make, I think that would make sense. So if you're telling somebody act you know we want you to pretend like you you can feel what they're going through i feel like that person is going to be like okay like i'll just do it and not actually necessarily experience the emotion although they're saying they based on heart rate so i don't know yeah. this really just struck me because first of all the fact that <laughs> that narcissism is such an issue that they were able to actually gather all these people who are supposedly narcissists but then the fact that somebody was trying to see if they could train empathy so um i think this goes in the face of the article last week or last time that we talked about, about how being a involved father rewires your brain. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that trains us to be more empathetic, but I wonder what would happen if we now went to a narcissist convention. <laughs> would we balance out? <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, there's a couple services that I want to talk about this week that I've been using. I've used them before, but I've been using them a lot this week and I just really love them. And then I, I'd really love to hear what your tip is too for the week, Felix. But sure. one thing that I, I – well, actually, so before I even get to that because this is my first link I want to talk about. But I want to talk about – it's sort of my tip of the week and it's about IFTTT, which we mentioned last time. Yeah. When I did the interview with Chris Dancy – who is the world's most connected man, you know, and he has 1,200 zaps running that are tracking everything. He has a motion sensor on his toilet, you know, and it's all, it's automated stuff. But what, and it's very complicated in a way, well, in, in a lot of ways, actually. But what he said, and what makes a lot of sense, is that with all that data and all that information, you really need some way to, you know, visually process it. Mm -hmm. So he essentially puts everything into his Google Calendar. And things, and you should see it. It's, there's images of it. Actually, we should post... Um, 
we should put an image of his calendar. I'm going to make a note of that too. And we'll, I'll put okay. it on uh, Instagram and then we'll, we'll put it in the link. Um, so Chris Dancy's calendar is a thing of beauty. It looks like it's a total mess, but it's, it's actually quite gorgeous. And there is, you know, in a, in a 20 minute time slot, there may be 30 things in there and they're all color coded. So he can see like things having to do with food or entertainment or health or spirituality or whatever it might be. So, you can start doing this, and it's actually a really good way to start self-tracking, especially if you don't want to make too much of an effort. Yeah. And, the, and the way to do it would be with IFTTT. So pretty much anything that can be a trigger in IFTTT, everything from the weather to a place you check in on Foursquare to a tweet that you send, any of that stuff can then be – the action can be add, a, uh, add an event to my Google Calendar. Uh, okay. So it's a, for those people who are like, oh, I have all this data, like now what do I do? This is a really good way to get started. And I actually, I, I didn't even, it didn't even catch it when he told me this because I, I sort of did this, but nothing near this level. And you don't have to go to this level, but just for instance, if you use Foursquare, and I know that Foursquare is not so much the popular thing anymore, but Foursquare is great for really easily logging your location, right? Because you pull it up, it knows where everything is around you and you just, you go and do it. Right. If you put that into your Google Calendar, it's really kind of helpful if you can go, like for instance, right now I'm sick, it would be really interesting to me to see where I've been in the last four days and see if there's any kind of anomalies. Mm. You know, and maybe I could trace, and of course in my case it's, it's not really a big mystery, my son is in daycare and you know, daycare is basically like the CDC. So uh, it's, <laughs> I mean, basically he's going to have the strongest immune system ever at some point. but. Mm. It's true. You know, if you put that in your calendar and you kind of you uh, correlate it to something that's going on, so you have location, and then maybe you tra- maybe your location is a restaurant, and then you track what you've eaten, and then that's in the slot next to it, and then maybe you're at that restaurant because of a meeting with someone, and that's in that slot too. So you actually can do- co- correlate an enormous amount of information very easily just by looking at your calendar. And what he said, which I found so amazing, and I've already repeated this like six times in in different places, but if you're feeling weird for any reason, just look at who you've been with in the last three hours, you know, or if you're in a bad mood or something, and and because of like toxic people, toxic relations, Mm. just think about who you've been with in the last three hours. So if you can go back and look at your calendar and see in the last three hours where you've been, what the weather has been, who you've seen, what you've eaten, maybe how many times you've gone to the bathroom or not, whatever, you know, if you want to track that, um, how many steps you've taken, what your heart rate's been, all these different things that can track, but then they're all in your calendar and you can just go back three hours. It's, wow. it's pretty fantastic. So that's my sort of, it's sort of my tip recommendation of the week. Start looking at IFTTT and seeing what things you can have feed into your Google calendar. And okay. you may get some really interesting things. Yeah, even, okay, you know, fi- even financial stuff, you know, like let's say yeah. you pay somebody with Square or you have a transaction on Mint or uh, you with Square today. Yeah. Yeah, right. Or PayPal, you know, mm. and those, all those things can be put right into Google Calendar. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you got a big payment, someone paid you a big amount on PayPal and then two hours later you had, mm. you know, something really good happen, whatever. Like it's, it's really interesting to start seeing these correlations. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's that's my uh, my recommendation for the week. Yeah. What about cool. you, Felix? You got a tip? Well, you know, what? I'm just going to see what what I've got. Um, the the one I, I want to reiterate, and I know you, this is obviously what you one of the best things you you taught me. Uh, but I just want to talk about the Pomodoro technique because I um I just swear by it so much and want everyone to try it. Um, and the Pomodoro technique, which I'm you know are um, regular listeners will know is where you, where you, uh, where you work in, in sets of 25 minutes and you take a five minute break and then every four sets or so you take a, take a longer break, like 15 minutes. Um, but everything you, you, you work anyway, uh, that's what it is. And I, and I'm a composer. I write music for film and TV and normally I have to write, you know, a lot of music and really focus and sit down there and work it for long periods of time. And the Pomodoro technique really helped me so much because, because, um, you can see exactly how much time you have to, the thing I find, this is what I want to say is I want to sort of give my tips about how to get into using the Pomodoro technique. Cause it did take me a, took me a while 
yeah. to get into it and to really grasp it. The first most important thing is that you take the break. And that's the hardest thing about it in a way. <laughs> because you sit down, it's like half an hour. I'm fine, half an hour. Why the hell do I need to get up and get and take a break? Just get out of the room, go make a coffee, come back in five minutes. That's all you need to do. Um, and you have and to you interrupt your work. That's the important thing. Yeah, you what? have to interrupt your work. Exactly. Yeah. If you're not, not done, you just have to stop. And, and but the, the things that I really, really like about it is obviously the noticeably increased productivity. I mean, I already increased my productivity by literally two, two times, possibly three times. And, um, and that's partly as a result is that I like to have the timer on screen. I use a, a web-based app. Um, it's just a website, actually. It's just tomato timer, tomato, tomato timer.com. And we'll put a, we'll put a link to that. Yeah. And that is just, I love that one. It's great. It's there. And I have it on my screen and I can always see what the time is. So having the time visible is a huge, for me, it's a very important part of it. And, um, and then here's my other thing that I really like is that normally after working for eight hours on, you know, a piece of music or several pieces of music, my brain is completely fried. But when I use the Pomodoro technique, I feel great. You know, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> well, so it's the same concept of high intensity interval training, which, you know, we do in our workouts a lot is that the brain yeah. and the body work better in these sprints with a small period of rest, at least, than they do yeah. in these long marathons. Plus, by putting an end cap on the work you're doing, even if you're not finishing the whole project, basically, mm -hmm. it's. I think that's really helpful, right? You're just you're just not going and going and going. Yeah, exactly. And I find that here's the thing: is that when when I have when I'm like overloaded with work and I have a huge deadline, it's really easy to say, "Oh, I'm going to stuff this Tom Pomodoro technique. I'm just I need to like work solidly today." No, 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 no. That's exactly where you need to need to use it, and it's really easy to slip into that. So, Felix, do you know who the founder of the Pomodoro Technique was? <laughs> <laughs> Francesco Cirillo. And the reason I know that is because we are going to have him on the podcast, I just found out. Oh, really? Oh, fantastic. Yes. Great. So the Pomodoro Technique has been really helpful for a lot of people that I've worked with, um, so much so that I really do want to talk to him because <clears throat> there's a lot of aspects to it. That is the, the, the real heart of it, but it's become sort of a bigger productivity system in some ways. And I've actually... I had one client who uses this just for doing his email. So <clears throat> when he's processing email, he uses the Pomodoro technique. So when he's in his inbox dealing with you know the hundreds of emails that he gets yeah. in a day, that's it. He's in his email. That's the task, which is really great. That, and that's the um, that's the other great thing about it is that you can apply it to anything you're doing. Exactly, um, yeah. and and it, it, it's you know whether you're cleaning out the garage or you're you know you doing your work, you can you can apply it. Those are, I think, those are two pretty good examples. <laughs> well, yeah, because I mean, I mean, we've just been cleaning out the um, the basement here, and and we didn't ap apply it. We we did apply it more. We, but I wish we had because what happens is you come to the you, after three hours, there's all this stuff that you have to organize, and you just can't think what to do with it. Yeah. You just need a break, and you know that next time you come to come down tomorrow morning, just continue. You know exactly what to do, and it's only because you because you're completely uh, overwhelmed and you haven't had a break at all. Yep, exactly. So I, I definitely recommend people check out the Pomodoro technique, and we will definitely link to that as well in general. But watch out for that interview, which I hope to be doing in the near future. Yeah. So uh, the other couple services I just wanted to mention that I've used again I've used them before, but they're just they're worth mentioning before we get to the interview is uh, Trap Call and Uber Conference. So. I've been using Google Voice for a long time for my just for my voicemail, mm -hmm. but and it's great. But the Google voicemail transcription is not amazing, um, and there's other services out there that do transcriptions and they're better and they offer other things. There's mm -hmm. a, so there's a somewhat sneaky service called Trap Call, which oh, yeah. I really like. And Trap Call offers a couple different levels of service. So it is a paid for service, but uh, I think it starts at four dollars a month. And so they'll do voicemail transcriptions, and they're much better than Google Voice, for, first of all. But they, it offers two other features, which are pretty cool. Well, three, actually. So one of which is that when you get an, a text from, I'm sorry, when someone calls you, if you miss the call, if it goes to voicemail, you just miss the call, 
you'll get a text with the person's name and number. And it actually will get that information from the phone register. So just like on your caller ID mm -hmm. on, at home where it actually says someone's name and number, not like on your phone when you have an unknown number, you just see the number. This will yeah. text you with the person's name and oh, information. Really? Yes. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, if you get a missed call, it can send you a text also. So meaning that like if you were out, out of service for some reason or you know, okay. so you'll get that. It also has the ability to record incoming calls if you want which is also an interesting feature. But the most interesting feature, which I really love, uh, is that it can unblock blocked numbers. Unblock blocked numbers. So if somebody calls you, and uh, you, yeah. know, you know you get a call and it says like blocked number, or number blocked. Or does it, normally it's on my phone, it just says unknown caller. Right, so that too. Yeah. Private caller, unknown caller. This will oh, yes yes I have seen the blocks yeah okay so this will unblock it so it's you can see the person's number pressed a sequence yeah okay. and now you, you could say like oh because the thing is if you notice when people call you telemarketers call you they're not usually calling you from a blocked number they're usually like you know in Arkansas or some random eight hundred number or whatever yeah. this so blocked numbers could be a real estate broker it could be a doctor it could be just somebody who is weird and doesn't want to share their number I, I think it's actually very annoying when someone has a blocked number. And I never would answer a blocked number typically, but this unblocks the number. So basically you get the blocked number, someone calls from a blocked number, you ignore it, and then about a second or two later, it rings again with, the, with their full number displayed. So okay. it's pretty cool, I really like that. Um, How does that work, is that like an app on your phone? Or something? No, okay, so this is really cool. So basically what it does is, uh, in the US, if you're calling a toll-free number, that means that the person that you're calling is paying for the call, right? Yeah. Because of because they're paying for the call, the telephone system doesn't allow a blocked number to call an 800 number. It will unblock it so that the person isn't, you know, so somebody from yeah. like Dubai isn't calling with a blocked number and then the person with the 800 number has to pay for it. So basically what you're doing is you're forwarding it to an 800 number. They unblock it and then route it back to you. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So it's not it's sneaky, but it's not terrible in any way. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a nice little service. Uh, and then the other one also has to do with telephony, and it's Uber Conference. So there's tons of conference services out there for doing conference calls. Yeah, yeah. I have tried a lot of them, and now that I have the the mastermind group going, I really had to pick one that I like, and yeah. I've gone with Uber Conference. So Uber Conference is a conference service, and you get a dedicated phone number and page if you want. Uh, you can use it for free, but the premium service is like 10 bucks a month, which is literally a tenth of what most other services are. You can schedule calls. You can start calls immediately. That's all cool, and that's all normal. But so what, we're talking phone conferences. Phone conferences, yes. Okay. But yes. what you can do, there's an iPhone app, and you can go to a website. So you can call in through your computer, and mm -hmm. you'll see... A picture of everyone or some sort of either the location or a picture of everybody that's on the call. And then when anybody is talking, they light up. So you know who's talking. Uh, cool. You can mute specific people. Great. You, you can share your screen. So if they're on the if they're on the website also, they can see your screen. You can text, yeah. you can do a chat with them. It will record the call for you. It's, which, like, it's like in the movies. Yeah, <laughs> but, well, kind of. It's pretty cool. Um, and it works on the yeah. iPhone app and it will record the call. So like for my mastermind groups, I always post a recording of the call after, so that's really nice. Yeah. It will also dial out to all of the participants at the time of the call. So they don't have to worry about PIN numbers or anything like that. It will just call oh, them at the yeah, right that's time. That's great. Yes. Yeah. So it's awesome. Wow. That is cool. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's, well, that's it for this week. Basically, the interview this week is with Mike Mondello from Seabear. And I discovered Seabear, Seabear really randomly because they offer a vacuum packaged salmon, wild caught salmon, that is not processed at all and it's delicious and it's really healthy. And so we talk salmon and healthy fish and how things are prepared and sort of the sustainability of fishing. And it's a, a really, really cool interview. And Mike was hap, uh, generous enough to give us a discount code for everybody listening. So oh, wow. check out the interview and get the notes from the show notes, which we will post up. And thanks for tuning in. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye. So now I'm talking to Michael Mondello, who is the president of Seabear Wild Salmon. So hi, Michael. Thank you for talking to me. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks so much. So I, I'll tell you, 
I found out about your product. I'm not sure where, and I tried it, and that's and I loved it, which is which is the reason that I wanted to have Michael on here. So, first of all, uh, let's talk about what Sea Bear is and what you do. Okay, so Sea Bear is a uh, specialty uh, seafood business that uh, started in 1957 up in Anacortes, Washington, which is about uh, 75 miles north of Seattle. We sell a whole range of high-end uh, specialty seafood, mostly direct to consumer through the web and catalog. Uh, we're grounded in smoked salmon and wild salmon dinners, but we have wild Alaskan halibut, crab, tuna, shrimp, uh, appetizers, chowders, a whole line of uh, things for entertaining gifts and, and healthy dining. Okay. And, and let's, what, let's talk about what sustainable fish really is because you know a lot of people hear about grass-fed beef and that's very popular now but mm -hmm. but wild caught fish is is medicine as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. so sustainable uh we we buy virtually all of our seafood from alaska and alaska is an extremely well-managed natural resource you'll find wild alaskan salmon for example at the very top of the monterey bay aquarium um uh, list of uh, of good choices they are uh, extremely diligent about. It. They'll shut down a fishery if it's not uh, if it's not having returns in a given year that that look right, um, and they've done it for 45, 50 years. So it is a the state has just done a tremendous job of making sure that it is not an overfished resource and uh, and that it'll be there for you know generations to come. Right, and and so let's talk about first of all, let's talk about some of the health benefits of fish. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> Do you, do you eat a lot of fish? Well, of course I eat a lot of fish. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. And I mean, when I was uh, dealing with uh, chronic illness and inflammation and, and became a vegetarian and then reintroduced fish to my diet, the, the difference to me was noticeable, hugely, really noticeable. And I eat as much fish as I possibly can. So mm -hmm. what, I mean, generally speaking, what, you know, what are the health benefits that people should expect to see from fish? Well, there's, you know, there's, as you, I'm sure, are quite aware, there's tons of research uh, available that talk about everything from uh, heart uh, heart benefits to brain to eyes to skin to, uh, you know, avoiding Alzheimer's. Is everything that uh, it's it's sort of a miracle food, you know. Um, we're not doctors, and we don't make any health claims on our products other than it is a great natural source of omega three fatty acids. And the, health, and the medical community, you know, can tell you how great that is for your health. Um, we recommend we uh, we like to follow the American um, um, Medical Association guidelines of twice a week or more um, for eating a fatty fish like salmon. And what we even do on uh, with our employees, we give them what we call uh, sea bear bucks, so that they can buy or actually just get free uh, salmon to build into their net into their um, into their their weekly menus for healthy eating. That's that's wonderful. Uh, so then, I'm, I'm assuming you actually have a pretty healthy staff then. <laughs> uh, well, and so I do want to talk about a specific product, which is the ready to eat wild salmon. Which uh, you know, when I first saw this, I was like, okay, well, it's packaged salmon, whatever. But I tried it, and it's amazing. And as much as I love salmon, I love fish. Sometimes it's just not as convenient. It's I mean, it's usually not as convenient as just pulling, you know, for some people, a slice of turkey out of a package or something. Right. You know, having to you do have to prepare it somehow, but. The, the these pouches. Well, actually, so let's. Why don't you tell everybody what these ready to eat pouches are? So the pouches are they're pure wild salmon with just a touch of sea salt, uh, dropped into these pouches. That uh, actually, that pouch technology is something that our company created many many years ago, and we just vacuum out the air and then cook the salmon in its own juices uh, under pressure. Think of it like a big pressure cooker, as as, uh, as though you were making jams at home. And it is so that pouch is essentially a flexible can, but as you know, it's much much thinner than a can, so you don't need to cook it as long. It's you know infinitely more convenient than a can, and the salmon doesn't have to be just dropped in a big chunk. So it is uh, it'll stay it'll stay good for many years as long as that pouch is not open or leaking or punctured in any way. That salmon will will tell customers that it'll be good for four years or more. And frankly, that's conservative. Because it is a um, it's it's a natural process. There's nothing in there but the salmon, salt, and its own juices. And how I mean, so that was kind of amazing to me. Like, how is that even possible that it can? You don't have to refrigerate it. You don't have to, like. I mean, how is it possible without preservatives? Well, think of it is again. Think of it like a can. I mean, we've taken out all the air and then cooked it in there, and that process exactly like as if you were canning. Well, if you were canning tuna fish in a can, 
It does the exact. It, it has the same properties of just stopping any bacterial growth. So the product in there is as good as it was when it went in. And uh, again, if it's not packaged isn't damaged in any way, it'll be good for many, many years. Totally natural process. Flexible canning is the best way I can describe it to you. Okay, and and how involved do you, I mean? Well, I'm I'm assuming you're very involved actually in in the the fish selection process. You know, so you're getting this from diff, you're getting it mostly from Alaska, but are there mm-hmm. particular fisheries that you work with, or or how are you selecting? What's the criteria? Yeah, uh, we uh, we've. We make a uh, we make ourselves kind of pain in the butts. We're pretty high, we establish a very high quality standard, and we've sent back fish many 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 times that have been promised us to be you know number one A quality, and they show up and they're not. And they can range from anything to be or not very good at all to you know just below that level. But that's not what we that's not what we expect. So we um, we're pretty diligent. We do buy from a range of sources. We don't have our own fishermen. We bought, we buy from processors and different co-ops and things like that uh so just over the years setting a quality standard uh, the market understands what we're looking for and that's really important you can't have great food without great raw material of course and, and so i mean i don't want to make you reveal you know some sort of proprietary process but i, I am really curious like you know to me so often what what to, to me is like a bad salmon is if they get very like mealy you know and it's hard they, the the texture doesn't seem to hold up so like when you I mean, are you seeing the fillets coming in? Are you seeing the whole fish? Like, what 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 do you look for? Sure. Well, we get um, overwhelmingly we buy what's called H and G fish, headed and gutted. So it's it's the whole fish minus the head and the and the guts have been taken out. So we do fillet it. We do everything by hand. We start with that product. We hand fillet it, hand trim it, and so at that process, we're seeing the meat right away, right? And at that time, our uh, our team knows and our operations folks know. That you can tell right there if the product's going to be uh, mealy, as you said, or it's going to have if it has uh, any significant issues in, in the flesh, we'll see it. And we've rejected uh, plenty of batches at that stage. We'll just stop filleting and send it back. Uh, but it also, you can see if you can see a fillet at that point, which is looks fine, uh, and then have it go through the process and find later out later on in the steps that uh it's either dry or it's got an off flavor or things like that and we catch those through our uh, on, we have a very very diligent uh, quality assurance program in place and then at the end of it we have a daily sampling program where we engage a pretty broad group of our um of our team to taste and they've been trained on how to taste wow okay that's pretty cool uh that, that sounds like a fun taste testing job <laughs> it, it is a fun job yeah <laughs> and and how long is it typically between catch to package so the from the time it comes into our plant to the time it goes in the package is typically depending on what the product is, uh, smoked will be about uh, forty eight hours. The product you're referencing, uh, the ready to eat, will generally be about twenty four hours. Oh, and then and then what about from when it's caught to when it gets to you? That can be uh, all sorts of things. Much of what we do actually comes in frozen, and that's the way the industry works. Now, frozen can be if people freeze well. It stops the biological clock, and the product's spectacular. If the product is frozen poorly, it's terrible, right? So, I mean, that's a big part of the of the quality game on on how we buy. But most of the fish does come in frozen, so it's been it, it could be you know anywhere from that week to you know last month or whatever. But it's it's a um, uh, it doesn't matter as long as it's been frozen correctly. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, that, so let's talk about that for a second because that that's always something that I find interesting, and I've spoken to chefs about this before and stuff, and and. I've actually heard people say that they would prefer the frozen fish to a uh, you know quote unquote fresh caught fish sometimes because it's frozen on the boat, right? Yeah, if it's frozen well, it really does think just think about it, it does stop the biological clock. So that fish, if frozen well and frozen close to the point of catch, is going to be in that restaurant as you're mentioning with the chef, if it, it'll be a fresher tasting experience than one that was caught fresh, never frozen, goes through a distribution channel and might show up in his restaurant, his or her restaurant, you know, five, six, seven days later. So if done well, it can be a higher quality product. Yes, absolutely right. Great. Okay. And, and you know, one of the things that people always talk about, is it, is it fresh or frozen? Well, the opposite of fresh isn't frozen. The opposite of fresh is rancid, right? I mean, they're not, <laughs> no, they're not, they're not the same. So it, you can have a beautiful, fresh, fish fresh tasting fish uh, that has been frozen okay so now something personal what's what's your favorite way to have salmon 
Okay. Well, it uh, it depends on how I'm having it. If okay. I'm having a grill, there's no question. Uh, my if I'm going to have a dinner of salmon, I'm going to have it on the grill, and I'm I'm going to have king salmon because it's a big, thick piece. It's very, very oily and fatty. It's lovely off the grill. If I'm going to have uh, a lunch. I have what you referenced earlier. The ready to eat salmon pouches because uh, they're so versatile and and convenient. Okay, so and then since you said two times or more a week, how often do you actually eat fish? Is it every day? Um, at home, it's you know that that varies a great deal depending because uh, uh, we have different levels of interest in fish in our family. But I probably <laughs> eat it because I'm at work. I'm probably eating it for lunch, you know, four days a week. Right, and then, right. And um, then some, sounds- you know, some tastings on the side besides that. So. Sure. So, and, and that sounds really great. So, uh, so the last question I just want to ask you here, which is what I ask everybody at entities. And you know, since you're you're a businessman, you're you're not you're not a fisherman, right? You didn't come from a fishing background. I, I come from a fishing background, though. Okay. So, what are your top three personal kind of tips for being more effective in general? Top. You mean in a, in a management role? No, in anything, you know, anything that you've ever learned, you know, could, I mean, eating more fish could be one, but I mean, anything that you think that makes you more effective in your, in your daily life. Yeah. So one of my favorite things that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Stephen Covey book, uh, seven habits of highly effective people. Sure. Sure. So the, uh, my favorite of the seven is starting with the end in mind. I mean, I think anytime we've ever had successes, we've started with the end in mind. And when we kick ourselves over failures, cause we didn't do that. So I think that's gotta be, uh, that's got to be number one. Um, number two for me, and this is true in, in uh, certainly at work, but it's even true in nonprofits or anything that we get involved with. If you want to build a winning team, winning, if you want to have a winning team, you have to draft a winning set of players. Uh, again, failures have come when you know you have a team that you just know isn't up to the game, um, and you try and make it work anyway. But when you have the right team, it's easy. It's easy to win. And then uh, the final thing, and this applies to anything in life, is if you're going to do it, do it with passion. Oh, great. I think those are wonderful. Well, Michael, thank you very, very much. I, I want, I really, really want everybody to try some of these Seabird products because they're amazing. We're going to have links to it in the show notes. And uh, is there any particular package that you recommend? Because I just went with the regular one. But I mean, any, any of your products, actually, that you're particularly proud of that people should try? We are. Uh, well, you, you've talked about the ready to eat, but I'll tell you, this is summertime and our, um, our most popular thing right now and our favorite thing all summer is what we call our fresh and wild program. It's where we're getting fresh salmon and halibut from really cool little specialty runs throughout the Pacific Northwest. There's a different one every week. We bring it in, hand fillet it and ship it out to people fresh. And it's just an amazing, uh, amazing program. Great. Well, Thank you again. It was really nice talking to you. Nice talking to you too. Thanks so much for having me.